Hi, everyone, and welcome to our session on digital democracy and future realities. Thank you so much for coming early this morning and for joining us for what I believe will be a very interesting and exciting conversation. So I'll just briefly talk about why we're having this conversation and how it came about. Um, first, let me just quickly introduce myself. My name is Nima Ayer, and I am the founder of Policy. And Policy is a feminist civic tech organization based in Kampala, Uganda. And when I first founded Policy about six years ago, there was a lot of buzz around civic tech. And I feel even like using the word civic tech feels a bit dated. Like it feels very, you know, 2016, 2017. But it's the same topics with just different names um, and the sim similar ideas. And why, this is really interesting to me because I, I vividly remember the first time I used the internet um, back in the early 90s and just how much joy it had and how it felt like you could create anything and it felt, you know, it felt free and accessible. And then slowly over time, things changed and platforms became very gated and then you had to be in these closed spaces and sort of the dreams that we had for, you know, this this open internet that we could all use was um, slowly diminishing in some ways. So now we have a lot of platforms that are fueled by commercial interests and um, you know, fueled by advertisement or they're fueled by divisive politics online. And so the question that we are asking here today is what happened to the spaces that would have been publicly owned and publicly governed. What, what, what happened to those spaces? Do we still have an opportunity to create those kind of spaces? Who should be having these conversations about making these spaces? Um, and yeah, that's kind of why we're all gathered here and also to get different perspectives of who can be in the room, who's not in the room, who should be in the room. And yeah, also generally to talk about how this term of public good has changed over time, but how it's still very much the same concept and still very important and very relevant. So I hope you will have a great conversation with us. And the format we'll have is that we'll talk together for about 40 minutes on the panel, 40, 50 minutes. And then we would love to have time to open it up to hear your perspectives and also to get your questions. So. I know there's often, you know, this is not a question, but, but if you do have interesting comments to add, that would definitely be welcome. So I would love to start the panel, and I will first start off with Mallory, and I'll give a quick introduction to Mar Mallory Nodal. Uh, Mallory is CDT's, that is Center for Democracy and Technology's um, Chief Technology Officer. She is a member of the Internet Architecture Board and the co-chair of the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group. She takes a human rights people-centered approach to technology implementation with a focus on encryption, censorship, and cybersecurity. Mallory, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask you is generally about what do you think about the general concept of public internet infrastructure or public goods? What how would you explain it to the people in the room, first of all? And what good is it providing to us? Or, or, or even what's the potential of what it could provide to us? Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me and for having me here to talk about this topic. What I really like about your framing of this panel is it answers the question, internet for what? Because I feel that we often just assume that the internet is inherently a good thing. And that's actually not a bad assumption. I think we all arrive at the same conclusion. But I don't think we introspect or remind ourselves enough what for and what um, does it provide. Um, I think that where governments and corporations have made the case for why we need to move online and digitize, often those are austerity measures, often those are ways of replacing um, infrastructure with digital infrastructure, and I think what, what we're talking about in this panel is the opposite. Why do we have the internet? Why do we believe in it so much? Why is it so important? And I can tell you from uh, a while back, um, I've been in this space for um, a terribly long time, it turns out, and I remember when um, we didn't have social media or we couldn't take for granted that one could simply go on the internet and build oneself a platform or share information. It started for me 
um, when I was an activist with Indie Media, where we were um, going around mostly just filming protests or sharing information about protests. And then that wound up online because the Indie Media websites were ostensibly somewhat open. They were kind of the proto web 2.0. You could upload an event um, or share event details with people. You could then post a blog or we just called it news. <laughs> we could post news from a protest on the Indie Media website. And then those got published and so that sort of citizen media became a real um, precursor to what we see now pervasively in social media where a lot of that content now is on corporate owned private space platforms. Um, indie media still exists, those things are still around. Um, other things that are in that spirit are like Wikipedia, right? Or things that where we're co-generating with one another um, in aggregate content. Um, and I think the other thing that um, back in that time when I'm, I'm really stretching my mind backwards where we were really insistent upon owning the technology and not just owning it, you know, in terms of having a bare metal server somewhere in a co-location center that you could visit it and check in on it, see how it's doing, install the software you want on it, make sure you have the encryption keys and no one else, et cetera, et cetera, was that we were also really invested in figuring out how to do it too. So it wasn't just about the having, it was also about the doing and the making. And I feel like that in and of itself was quite an empowering sort of action because we were actually building cool tools, like I mentioned, you know, indie media sort of invented social media. We were, um, and, and we were hacking on it, we were figuring out. And so I think there's some spirit of that that still happens. I see it everywhere. It's, it's sort of a yes and. Right? It hasn't, it hasn't been that corporates have sort of replaced this. It's just that we now have to compete with the corporates that, of course, act in anti-competitive ways. They are interested in capturing users. They have all kinds of other incentives. And so while some of those traditions are still around, they're just not as present. They're not as well used. They're not as well remembered. Um, and so I think, yes, the internet is itself a public good, but I think all of the things that sort of come out of it when the um, the exercise is itself the end goal, um, really, I think, is what communities end up coming up with as what are public goods for them. Um, so I think I'll stop there and let you introduce the rest of the panel. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to that um, in terms of what you said. For example, what groups do you think benefit from these, these public goods and, and who is excluded as well? Um, just as you said, you know, the corporations own, um, tend to own them now, so... If you could yeah, just expand on that. Yeah, I think your question about exclusion is a good one, and I, I sorry, I didn't mention it before. Um, I do think that while we like to valorize the sort of hacking and the making and the doing, it is not that inclusive. It does require a lot of time, and so much of um, the people in this space still today are folks who have free time or that have jobs that align with this sort of work. And so it does, by virtue of that, simply exclude people who maybe don't have a lot of time to just try to figure out the technology or they don't have access to those things. So I think we, we shouldn't be too overly um, enamored with this idea that we can just build it and make it. It actually does take a lot of time. It does take a lot of investment. And so I think without a concerted effort to build up um, the public good internet, without real investment in money, again, because we're not doing this for profit, there is no business model, um, that uh, it, won't, it won't thrive and, and in a lot of places won't even exist at all. Um, and because these communities are very much bootstrapping communities, um, meaning that once they exist, they Mallory, start to grow. There's a request for you to speak a little bit slower. Oh, certainly, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yes. Um, so I was just finishing up, but what I was saying is that a lot of the communities that make public good internet technology tend to be uh, self-perpetuating, so that, that needs to be grounded in existence. And the opposite then is also true. If there is not a strong community of building a public good internet nearby, it's really difficult to expect one to just happen. Um, or expect the local communities there to benefit from a global public good internet when it's not in their local language, it's not necessarily serving their needs. So again, I'll just reiterate the main point here is that it takes effort and investment, support, money, et cetera, to make it happen. 
Thanks, Mallory. I think I have. I, I still have more questions on that topic, but let me get on to the um, some of the other speakers as well because I, I definitely am curious in terms of when you know when you say the investment and the money for a public good that will not make money as well. And yeah, I'm, I'm curious. We'll discuss it later. Like where where might this money come from and how would it be sustained? But we'll come back to that. Uh, I would like to bring on our next speaker. Um, who is Bill Thompson from the BBC. Yeah, I think he'll... Hello. Hi. Can I be seen or even heard? We're just waiting for your uh, image to come up on the screen. Just one. It, I'll introduce you me, in the meantime. It's not worth waiting for. Okay. Uh-huh. Oh, well. I'll introduce you in the meantime as that happens. So... Uh, Bill will be joining us Thank remotely. You. Bill leads the public value research in BBC Research and Development. He's also well known as a technology journalist and advisor to arts and cultural organizations on matters related to digital technology. From January 2001 to April 2023, he was also a regular studio expert on the BBC World Service technology program, Digital Planet, which is also known as Go Digital and Click. And he still appears regularly as an independent commentator. He's an adjunct professor at Southampton University and member of the board of the Web Science Trust. So, Bill, we're still waiting for your image to appear. Should we just go ahead? I would carry on. I'm, okay. I'm better on the radio anyway. I know that. Oh, there you are. All right. So we can, we can <laughs> see you on the screen now. Welcome. Uh, Thank welcome you. and thanks for joining us very late your time. We really do appreciate it. So the question that I have for you today, Bill, is how can we build internet technologies that are architected, designed, and deployed to meet the specific requirements of public service organizations? So in, in simpler words, how do we make these public goods? And how do we um, make sure that they, they work within the current standards of the internet? So what's the best way we can go around to create these digital public goods? Only easy questions first. Then um, I think that it's interesting that you say that we do them in line with current internet standards, because that sort of assumes that what we've got now is a sufficient base for public service outcomes. Uh, and I'd argue, just in line with what Mallory has, has been eloquently saying, that the history of the network over the past now 50 years is that we have a set of technology standards that have failed to deliver public service outcomes, that have been subverted, that have been taken over by commercial interests um, intentionally, in that governments have sort of given that space to commercial interests, but also the standards, the technology, technical standards, the protocols themselves, have proved unable to resist um, commercial pressure and have not effectively delivered good outcomes. And, and we see that again and again in the way that the open web has been closed, in the way that sort of things we would like to happen in terms of open communications protocols haven't happened. So part of what we're looking at at the BBC is in fact to ask whether we need a, a significant intervention in the underlying technology stack, as well as work on regulation and governance. So let's not just accept the internet as it is, but let's think about how we might build it or improve it and design it to deliver those outcomes. So bring in the sort of um, communities that have been traditionally excluded from um, internet governance um, activities, bring in the sort of communities that were definitely not part of the conversation in the 1980s and 1990s when today's network was emerging and try to have a more structured conversation as a public service broadcaster, you see, the, the BBC has spent 100 years making television and radio work, and it feels to me that, you know, as part of our mission, we should be trying to work with others to make the internet work. And that means trying to you know, go back to basics, to ask ourselves what a network would look like that could allow us to effectively assert, say, identity, that could protect people from surveillance, that could deliver those public goods. And then on top of that, we could start to build a digital public sphere in which people could feel more fulfilled, could feel happier, could feel protected from, from some of the bad aspects of the commercial internet if they chose it. And, and so I'd say the two parts of your question go together quite effectively in that we want to consider what good public service outcomes are. We sort of know what they are in 
you know, in the real world. We sort of know what they are in the broadcasting space that the BBC knows very well. I think we're quite unclear about what they would be online, particularly when we have many different constituencies of interest. And so we need to have the widest possible coalition of interest, people talking about this, designing the network. But we shouldn't assume that what we've got today is actually the right starting point. Perhaps the radical thing to do is to accept that if we're to serve democracy and serve digital democracy, we should be willing to ask some very hard questions about the way today's network runs, the technical protocols, the design standards for our applications, and indeed governance, and whether that's the right way to deliver the sort of public service internet that we're looking for. Thank you so much for that, Bill. Um, I, I think it's interesting in terms of the design because uh, a few, I want to say a few weeks ago, there was suddenly a ton of platforms that came about to replace Twitter slash X. And it just felt like over the course of two weeks, there was like 10 new online platforms, but they all looked exactly the same. There was no innovation. It was just copy paste of the same platform. And it just felt so boring. Like, isn't there another way to design a space where we can share our very brief thoughts? But I, I think it's really interesting and like, yeah, how do we get to, to get together and, and design something that looks different from, from what we currently have? And yeah, it just, Indeed. it felt so restrictive. Indeed, and of course part of that is if you like, the network primitives, the underlying protocols that you have to work with if you want to build a modern social network are themselves quite limited. So, you know, the emergence of Activity Pub was brilliant because it was a different way of thinking about how you might construct an online social space. And it allows you to have different design criteria to work in a different way, to build security into it in a different way. And I think it's that novelty that is going to be absolutely important to the next generation of the internet. That what we've got now doesn't feel to me like it's a good starting point. So let's have the sort of radical conversations that we could have in this room and see where they take us. Lovely, thank you so much. All right, I would love to move to our next speaker, Anna Cristina Ruelas from UNESCO. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Anna is a senior program specialist at UNESCO Communications and Information Sectors Section for Freedom of Expression and Protection of Journalists. She has, been dedica she has dedicated her work to the promotion and defense of human rights, freedom of expression, and the right to information. Previously, Anna Cristina was the director of Article 19's regional office for Mexico and Central America. Once again, thank you for joining us. The question that I have for you builds upon what Mallory started, talking about who's included and who's excluded, and the kind of resources that are needed. So I'd love to ask you, how do we ensure that various stakeholders are heard and have the appropriate input so that we can develop these online governance structures that serve everyone? Great, thank you very much. Um, it's a great conversation. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to think um, of what Bill was just saying of how we are thinking the internet and how we are including different voices within the internet. But, and that reminded me of one of the things that uh, my first job of UNESCO was related to, which was trying to make indigenous communities content within the internet to be available and how the possibility of creating indigenous communities content, acknowledging that most of the content right now is content that do not relate to most of these indigenous communities. I'm Mexican and Mexico is the 11th uh, country with most multicultural uh, communities. So I, I was thinking on how can we actually make sure that diverse cultural content, that cultural expressions are well said in internet and that when we navigate into internet, we relate to those communities that live in our countries more than to other communities. And, and as long as, at the same time, as we relate to other communities from other countries. Because as I say, in my country, sometimes we don't know, we don't even know about indigenous communities even though they live in the side of our door. So I, I just was thinking about that because uh, this relates a little bit of what UNESCO is doing right now and what we're intending to, to promote in this process of defining how 
uh, the governance of digital platforms should look like uh, when, when we're facing different uh, processes, regulatory arrangements in different parts of the world. So UNESCO has started um, since September uh, 2022 a process of consultation on guidelines for the regulation of digital platforms. In the beginning, we started thinking about how the different discussions around regulation should take shape and, and try to create an understanding, a common understanding that a human rights-based approach should come into place. And we realized that there were three elements that we wanted to enforce. One is that, uh, as some of you know, UNESCO um, endorsed in a declaration unanimously that is called the Windowhead Declaration that said that information is a public good and that there's three, three steps to uh, actually make sure that information becomes as a share uh, good for everyone. The first one is transparency for internet platforms. The second one is empowerment through media and information literacy mechanisms. And the third one is media viability. So through that, Taking that in mind, uh, we started this discussion recognizing that, there, that the thing was happening in silos, that we wanted to maintain the freedom that we all have in the internet. We wanted indigenous community to be able to engage, to have cultural content within the internet as we have it. But at the same time, we were looking that regulation that was happening around the world was targeting the users and not seeing what the companies could do to be more transparent, to be accountable, to identify what was that phenomenon that wasn't to be targeted, such as disinformation, hate speech, etc. So through a different process, uh, it was three stages of open consultation where we received more than 10,000 comments from many of you. Um, we realized that what we wanted is one, to safeguard freedom of expression, access to information. And I'll say one thing that it, is, it will come in the next version is and diverse cultural content. Because one of the things that we aim in this process is to balance and make sure that whatever the governance system is, thinking that there's always complementarity between self-regulation, co-regulation, and statutory regulation, whatever that kind of, um, uh, of shape of arrangement, of regulatory arrangement is, the governance system, which is a group of people, a group of people that should be identified, and this relates to your question, we need to identify those stakeholders that are interested to participate in the governance system. And the governance system had to be able to create balance in the participation of these stakeholders. We need to bear in mind that when we're talking about a governance system, we need to include those voices that are mostly affected by the different phenomenons that we are seeing in the internet and that are the issues that we want to address in order, and all, in order to also preserve freedom of expression, access to information, and diverse cultural content. So this is one of the things that UNESCO guidelines are trying to put forward, how we can ensure that governance systems are transparent, how we can ensure that governance systems are accountable, that they uh, promote uh, diverse cultural content, that actually they are and have in place check and balances, because sometimes even when we're talking about self-regulatory measures or self-regulatory arrangements, there's not within a specific check and balances or mechanisms to be accountable. Uh, and we want them to be able to May, uh, to be open and inclusive and accessible for everyone, not only for the ones, the technical community or the people that knows about the internet, but the people that wants to engage with the internet and have in the possibility of, of, of create their own content. Um, so I will say that for us, uh, there's, I, I'll say one, two, three, four, five, six elements that we said about the multi-stakeholder approach within this governance system. The first is acknowledging and identifying the stakeholders, including the companies that should be responsible uh, for, uh, uh, for, for the compliance of 
the five principles set in the guidelines, then afterwards I can talk about them. And when identifying these companies, the regulators should uh, take in mind, bear in mind, yes, on one hand, the size, two, the market share, and three, the functionality of the platforms. And in this last section, I want to stop a little bit because it has to do with public interest, uh, internet, technologies. Um, in this last section, the, the, the guidelines are clear that when a governance system identify which are the companies that should be on the scope, there should be a clear understanding of what is the kind of functionality business model service that the, 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 that the companies uh, place, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I could read the thing, but it's complicated. Um, and then the second thing is, encouraging inclusive participation. And when we say encouraging inclusive participation, it's not about only the usual suspects, but actually one of the things that we receive from the various in submissions from the consultation, for instance, for children from 13 to 18 years old, we're like, we want to participate in these discussions. We are not in these discussions, you know, like, and you're always trying to protect us, but how are we enabling the possibility for us to participate and engage more in the internet and in the decision-making process of the governance system? How are you giving us the tools to actually engage in these processes? And, and I think this is an important question because I, I, I don't see that we have been able, for instance, in this forum, to bring together like people that is actually the most important user in the internet right now. Um, the third thing is creating balance. That means acknowledging that the different actors within the stakeholder or the governance system have different levels of power. So we need to create balance and understand how balance will should be should be work. Ensuring transparency and accountability, as I already said, collaborative decision making. So it it, it tends to put forward a set of guidelines of how decision making is going to be. A, and then coordinating implementation efforts and evaluation. So that means that when we talk about multi-stakeholderness, it's not about just the moment of releasing any type of regulation or any type of code of conduct or any type of whatever. We need to participate in the implementation process and in the evaluation process. What we've heard from the regulatory groups is like civil society participates a lot in the process of, uh, uh, you know, advocates a lot uh, for or against regulation. But then once the regulation passes, they leave us alone. They are not with us. And we need to participate together because we are the technical persons that are going to implement, the, implement regulations that are facing the different questions and we don't have the participation of the different stakeholders in our decision making process. So I think that's another important thing and the evaluation process which allow us to identify if the governance systems is working or not. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna Christina. Thank you for, for breaking that down. I think that was really helpful. All right, we're going to move on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is Rachel Judistari from Wikimedia Foundation. And Rachel is Wikimedia Foundation's lead public policy specialist for Asia. She has extensive working experience engaging key stakeholders through lobbying and advocacy to promote knowledge sharing, innovation in village governance, human rights, and youth empowerment. All right, so what I was thinking about while this discussion was going on is that I have two separate Twitter accounts, and on one, it's the people in this room. It's about like open source or nonprofit um, driven public interest tech. And then on my other WhatsApp, uh, my other Twitter, it's purely for profit. And the conversations these two groups are having do not intersect at any point. Um, the for-profit one is about how do you launch a SaaS? How do you get the most money from your users per month? How do you, you know, raise your prices so that you can have the most money and recurring revenue? And it's just all about like how to suck out the most money from possible from customers, um, identifying their pain points. How do you keep them locked into the platform? A big thing in that is like how do you reduce churn, which is people dropping from your platform, and. Yeah, two very, 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 very different conversations. Um, so I wanted to ask you, when we think about um, public interest, uh, 
What does it mean to place this, this public interest, these public goods at the heart of innovation or, or regulation? So I feel like the innovation space is, is really being taken over by, I, I don't want to say corporations, but people who want to make profits. Uh, I also thought about this example a few weeks ago about couch surfers. So when I was, when I was in college, couch surfers was really popular. In case you don't know, it's, it's, it was basically a platform where you could go to different countries and stay for free on some, in someone's house, and you would stay on their couch, most likely. And after Airbnb came about, it totally, I, I feel that it killed couch surfing, because I actually logged into my account after like 10 years, and it's, a, it's become like a cesspool. It's, 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 the vibe is gone, you know? And then on the other side, it's all about Airbnb, and like how much money they can make, and how they've taken all the apartments. So, it's a long-winded way to say, like, yeah, how do we keep public interest when innovation nowadays is really focused on profit? Over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Nima, for giving me the longest questions. <laughs> One million questions. Uh, but yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, so I think I just want to summarize what has been shared by previous speakers, that um, the digital world today are mostly private and for profit platforms, as Nima also said. Um, and in some cases, the privatizations of internet amplify wealth gap, prevent equitable access, and also exacerbated knowledge gap, especially for women, indigenous people, people of color, and other socially depressed groups. Mm, it's also compromise our privacy and intensify polarizations and disinformations that is very detrimental to the protections of human rights and democratic values. So at this juncture, I also want to give you good news that Wikipedia still exists. We are the only not-for-profit platforms uh, which maintained by a community uh, of users that are consistently uh, ranks among the top 10 most visited websites. In this year alone, um, about 4.5 billion unique global visitors visit Wikipedia monthly. No one owns Wikipedia, and it's available for free without advertising, without selling personal data, while maintaining strong user privacy protections. Mm. So, however, when you mentioned about innovations, uh, this is also something uh, that we are consistently doing. Uh, we realized that uh, as the world's largest online free encyclopedia, we play an essential ro role in training most large language models, which is essential in generative AI. I think we've heard the buzzword um, since day one of IGF. I don't want to bore you. Uh, but what we are trying to do is to address knowledge gap within our communities. We also understand that while we are not for profit public interest platforms, we are um, far from ideal. Majority of the editors, we have uh, around 300,000 editors right now, um, are still from Global North. Uh, and we want to diversify our community of editors uh, and also providing tools and accesses for most repressed uh, group. For example, uh, Two years ago, we uh, launched Knowledge Equity Funds. And then this year, we provided funds to Aman Alliance Masyarakat Adat Indonesia, one of the largest indigenous people alliances with more than 2 million members, to create more content um, in wiki media projects uh, to um, um, preserve their indigenous uh, cultures and languages. We also have um, some uh, projects um, to ensure the participations of women, people of color, and queer people uh, through art and feminism. Um, so by uh, providing more profile of women um, in Wikipedia, we hope that it can shift the conversations around us. Um, and the second part of your question is also about regulations and what are the key principles that we need to preserve uh, to ensure uh, the protections of public interest platforms. Well, this is a dicey topic right now <laughs> because I feel like in the past few years we saw a surge of a very um, restrictive uh, regulations um, on content moderations and platforms. However, um, the creations of these regulations are often focused on um, <clears throat> 
the big tech um, and forget uh, to consider the diversity of internet surfaces. Um, so some of these uh, policies prescribe overly broad restrictions with um, highly punitive consequences, uh, which also affecting our decentralized community-based um, content moderations. Um, so uh, hopefully when new regulations are created or uh, the current regulations are revising, the um, policy makers can also uh, bear in mind the diversity of internet, especially if on, for uh, <clears throat> public interest platforms like Wikipedia, where we are using our community-led models um, to um, maintaining uh, the website, but also becoming the antidote of these informations. Because daily, our editors are doing fact-checking for more than 50 million articles that are available in Wikipedia. Um, and we also want to encourage the regulations um, that caters internet uh, to not solely uh, mandating automations of co uh, content detections, but also um, help create opportunities for people's participations to avoid creating a digital divide. Uh, another principles that need to be protected within the uh, internet um, regulations is um, definitely meaningful community participations in internet governance. I think Anna Christina has mentioned earlier on the importance of that, I, I, and I would, I would like to resonate with that because uh, decentralized content moderations model is one of the way to uh, preserving democratic values uh, in the internet. And we also see the importance of having open and free internet uh, for a diverse and equitable digital environment. We saw internet shutdown, service interruptions, website blocking um, as means um, to hinder Wikipedia volunteers' uh, collaborations. Uh, and hopefully this also can be addressed technically, but also re regulations-wise. Um, lastly, the regulations uh, should definitely safeguard user privacy and ban intrusive surveillance system while also upholding uh, our um, protections to human rights. And lastly, because uh, our next speaker will be coming from private sector, I also want to encourage uh, further collaborations and communications uh, with <clears throat> Uh, commercial platforms uh, that also have pivotal roles um, in um, sharing information globally. So thank you, Dima. I hope that I answer your questions. <laughs> yes, 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 definitely. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, but what you said also got me thinking about generally an interesting talking about how regulations are often aimed at big tech. And I was doing a couple of surveys, um, interviews a few months ago looking at Kenya's data protection. And, you know, on the surface, it looks great that there's these data protection laws, there's a data protection office, you need to comply with all these different laws. But then I think about small companies that are just starting out, because I used to be a small company that was just starting out. And I couldn't imagine adding that other layer of work that you'd have to do when you're a two-person company. And you'd have to follow all the same rules for a company that has 100,000 employees, and there's no way around that. And it feels extremely unfair that it's the same rules that applied despite such different contexts. So that was a really good point. Thank you for that. All right, I would love to bring on our last speaker, who we're very excited about, Widya listia Wulan, who is the VP of Public Policy of Traveloka. And Widya will be joining us virtually as well. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Widya has 20 years of experience on public policy. Currently, she leads the, la the, the leading, sorry, she leads policy work of Traveloka, the largest travel and lifestyle app in Southeast Asia. And previously, she managed public policy at Amazon Web Services and also worked in the UN. So, Widya, we're just waiting for your image to appear on the screen. If you'll just give us. Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome. There you are. Thank Hi, you. it's so lovely to have you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So yeah, as, as Rachel already prefaced, we're very interested to hear from you about how the private sector or, or you know, e-commerce businesses can, can be a part of this discussion about public interest tech. How can, how can companies 
ensure that some of the principles of public interest tech continue to live on. So if you can just add generally to the conversation that we've been having, we would really love the private sector perspective. Please go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Nima. Thank you, Nima. Hi, everyone. Good morning from Jakarta, Indonesia. Thank you for having us in here. My name is Rudia from Traveloka. But first of all, perhaps uh, some of you uh, not really familiar with Traveloka. So just a few seconds. Uh, I'd like to share uh, what we are doing in, in, in Asia, right? And how far we've been working uh, in terms of innovating travel and providing uh, convenient and, and uh, convenient services for customers uh, globally. So Traveloka has been here uh, since uh, 11 years ago. We started from, you know, meta search and trying to help uh, people to travel conveniently. And after 11 years of, uh, you know, working uh, with all of the ecosystem. Now we are operating in six countries in ASEAN. We have 40, more than 45 active users uh, monthly. We have more than 2 million partners uh, and by partners mean restaurants, hotels, uh, flights, uh, transportation, as well as all the ecosystem of, of tourism sector. And uh, you know we we don't stop here. We we hope to expand and work more and provide more and better service for customers uh, globally. Now to to add on the discussion that we have uh, this morning, we as company believe that uh, innovation uh, is the key factor. Technology and innovation are the key factor to boost uh, tourism uh, in in the world. And perhaps we remember uh, back in COVID uh, time, we understand that tourism is, you know, one of the biggest industry that hit the most by COVID because, you know, people don't travel, didn't travel, people, people didn't, you know, want to go outside and so on and so forth. However, Nima and everyone here, we actually very, very proud because this year we uh, published our impact study showing our impact to a community, to society, mostly during the COVID uh, era. So during that time, we actually contributed 2.7% GDP to tourism sector in Indonesia, and that's quite large. And we didn't work alone, obviously. We work with the government. We work with community in NIMA. We did a lot of digital literacy throughout the years, and we aim to have 100,000 uh, participants uh, from tourism sector in our digital literacy program. We work with community across Indonesia mostly. We work with women community. We work with um, fishermen and you know environment uh, community to make sure that we have sustainable uh, component in, in, in tourism because according to our data, there are four points as a trend in terms of tourism after, after COVID recovery. Number one is actually flexibility that we provide through our innovation and technology. Number two is people tend to travel uh, in nearby areas. Number three is people prefer to, to travel outdoor. And the last one is people actually prefer to travel in area that offers sustainability practices. And we actually focus to make sure that sustainable is in our core of business. Now we're talking about policy. Uh, I heard Rachel say that, you know, there should be a collaboration with the government. Bill mentioned the openness of government and we all, we agree with that. And therefore, Traveloka is actually very active in um, association, both locally and regionally. Uh, for example, in Indonesia, we have a association for e-commerce called IDEA, and we become one of the active a participant, active member, and actually we, we hold the position there. And also we, we actually the coordinator of industry task force. This is a task force assigned by the Ministry of ICT during T20 NEMA. So in that in these two uh, organization or association or community, if you may say so, we provide input, we provide practices, we provide lesson learned that we capture on the ground that we heard from uh, from our customers, and then we provide input to the government, to the regulators, with the hope that innovation, regulation, and customers can actually talk together, can actually produce a, a solution that fits for everybody needs, that provides safety for our customer, but still, you know, comply to the regulation in in the local. 
So I think uh, that's, you know, that's opening me my hope I answer your question and I'm happy to further discuss. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Vidya. Thank you. All right, I want to go back to Mallory with the question that I started um, in the beginning. And I'm actually gonna ask you two questions in one because I feel like they're related. Um, so of course we've heard from Widya, but I'd love to also get your idea in terms of, can public interest work in a for-profit model? And, and yes or no, maybe. But, but if not, like how would you otherwise fund the infrastructure and maintenance um, required for public interest infrastructure? Fair, fair question, I set myself up for this. Um, I just wanna correct, I think, a slight nuance that I hear a lot, which I don't think what we see in the massive corporate big tech space is innovation. It's monetization. They're taking things that people want that have already existed that are there, right? And then they're figuring out ways to make a lot of money off of it, right? So, um, you know, we've, we've come up with loads of examples already on this panel, I don't have to restate them. How do, you make that, how do you make that profitable? I don't know that that's the question, right? What we're asking is not profit, but sustain. How do you make it sustainable? So I think that there, is, there are a few different ways to look at this. This is not at all going to be coherent because this is not my area of expertise. But one, for example, is like barrier to entry. Right now, it's really difficult to compete because the barrier to entry is enormously high. We've monetized just about everything at this point. Right? We're, we're now picking up the scraps um, off the floor. Even, even the big corporates right, are suffering. Um, they pretend that it depends on the day, right? Are they doing awesome, making loads of money for shareholders, or are they really losing a lot of money and they need your pity? Um, it's hard to follow. Um, the other issue then, too, is um, we think, I think a lot of what we've been talking about so far is assumed that we're talking about platforms or social media, but there's actually tons of different services out there, right? There's, you know, email and web hosting. People do pay for those things. Businesses pay for those things. Um, there's financial services, certainly something that people pay for. Um, lots of things that are possible to be made in the public interest without um, profit seeking, um, but that typically just aren't because we're really just hyper focused a lot of times on like what's social media doing? How do you make social media profitable? Uh, and the last thing I'll just say is that um, I think a lot of our, a lot, I would say often we are critiquing this issue of surveillance and privacy violations in service of the quote innovative, you know, um, targeted ads based monetization, right? Um, that is really narrow and I think it's starting to break down already. Maybe I'm too eager to see it collapse, but I don't think it, that necessarily the issue is with advertising itself. There's a lot of ways to do advertising that's not targeting, right? Contextual advertising is great. If I'm already reading an article about something, it'd kind of be great to see ads related to it. Um, there's no need to necessarily, you know, again, like try to sell me wood, wool socks in Washington, D.C. in the wintertime. Like, I'm going to buy warm socks when it's cold in a place that I live. I don't need an ad from Facebook to tell me to do that. So we're kind of wasting a lot of potential on this idea of targeted ads, and so I'd really like to see that go. And I don't think that, for example, that is a um, monetization strategy that's at all compatible with the public interest, but we don't need to just look at the figures to make that determination. It's inherently a paradox to survey and to serve in the public interest. So I think maybe when we're coming up with monetization schemes or, or sustainability schemes, right, um, that there's alignment with values and then that really points the way towards what's possible. Um, and so I don't think that there's any issue with that. It's just, you have, it has to be done with principles in mind. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> and I, I think you've made such a great point that a lot of it, yeah, it's definitely not innovation. It's just monetization. I saw, um, I saw these angry messages from people because there was a, a website where you could learn, where you could get sheet music for guitar that had existed for like 20 years and was free and then somebody bought it up and made it a SaaS and now you have to pay a monthly subscription and yeah. But, but that was praised as, as a very good business. So on the other side, interesting. Okay, I'd love to bring Bill back. Um, hi, Bill. Hello there, I'm still here. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask, how do you determine responsibility 
and accountability for delivering various aspects of public interest internet. So, yeah, please go ahead. I, th I think that, I mean, it's a very broad question and a useful one. To some extent, it's the responsibility of everyone who wants a public service internet to, to figure out what they can do to contribute to it. And then we can look at existing institutions and organizations and ask whether they are aligned with the um, with the overall interests of the public service internet. So when uh, Vidya was talking about commercial engagement, there should be no barrier to commercial engagement with a public service network, as long as it's done on the public service terms and not on commercial terms. And there should be no barrier to anyone's or any organization's engagement, as long as almost they accept the, the, the terms of trade, that what, what we're looking for in, in supporting democracy online and supporting the idea of a digital public sphere where society can come together is something which is sustaining, something which has positive attributes and is not subject to commercial capture or monetization, uh, as Mallory was saying. In that sense, it's up to everyone to decide how they can contribute and how they can support it. The issue, as ever, is going to be coming up with some underlying principles that we can all agree on about how such a space, how such a network should be constructed and run. And then also feeling comfortable with the fact there will be divergence in how it's delivered into different cultures, to different interest groups, to different societies, to different countries. Because one of the problems that's emerged in the last few years has been the idea of the global timeline, that, that Facebook, uh, Twitter as was, want everyone to see everything and we all exist in the same space. And that's not how real life works. It's not effective for us as human beings. It's not effective for civil society. And so we need to abandon some of those core assumptions on which the existing systems have been, have been built and look, look to a different way. I do not have an answer. Um, I have an organization, the BBC, which has been quite good in the past at figuring out how to do these things in the world of broadcasting. I believe there are enough of us, some of us are in this room right now, who care enough about the model of an internet that is sustaining and nourishing to want to build it and to have those difficult conversations about what it might look like. And everyone brings their own concerns to the party. We try to be much more representative than we have been and certainly than we have been in the past 30 or 40 years building today's network. If we do that, my optimistic view from, from this side is that we can achieve something really good and valuable, that we can begin, we can outline the design principles for a network that will actually serve the public interest and will sustain civic society. As I say, I don't know what it is yet. I do think there's a process for getting there beginning to emerge. And this conversation is part of that process. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you. I, I have a last question and then I will open it up to the floor for a discussion. And my last question is to Rachel. <laughs> so this whole time we've been having a conversation, we've been you know, using words like public interest, public good, right? So we're inherently assuming that it's good. Um, and like as Mallory said at the start, you know, is the internet always good? Because I, uh, <laughs> I was having this conversation with somebody about how they brought the internet to these like really um, previously disconnected indigenous communities, and I almost felt sad. I mean, I don't like access, like, you know, access is great and everything, but also it's, sometimes it's like, yeah, what if we just lived in a world where we didn't have to know what was happening in American politics all the time? You know, what if? So let me ask, let me close my questions with asking, um, what unintended consequences could public interest technologies have? Um, yeah, so what could go wrong? Um, how might we anticipate and or mitigate them? Well, um, it's kind of very interesting questions, uh, but there are some risks um, 
that can be um, affecting public interest platforms, um, especially um, in the process of knowledge creations itself. Um, as you know, like um, two thirds of uh, global majority countries are consuming uh, information from the internet. However, uh, only <clears throat> less than 15% of representations of the global south are actively um, create knowledge online. Uh, and mostly um, the contents are in English. <clears throat> so one of the uh, possible um, risks um, that um, we might be facing um, is um, endangering indigenous uh, and less resources languages. Um, and as I shared, I shared with you, um, this has been picked up as one of the key priority of the foundations. Uh, knowledge equity is one of um, our main goal in achieving um, our 2030 uh, visions. Um, and in doing so, uh, we are working uh, with community of editors, uh, partners like the UN, um, um, and government uh, to do digital literacy so that more people can contribute in the creations of knowledge. Um, second of all, um, internet is only reflections of what's happening in the society. So it's unfair if you want to have a quote-unquote free and accessible internet while in reality civic space are shrinking. Um, and sometimes information in the internet, especially the creator of that, um, can be utilized um, to punish the information that they put in the internet. Um, um, and uh, we see some of these cases happening in public interest uh, platforms. Um, so definitely um, regulations that criminalize dissenting voices need to be addressed while we are also strengthening uh, community resources to ensure the um, uh, holistic security of contributors of the internet. Um, and ultimately, while we are thinking that internet is everything, uh, and um, if I don't have internet access uh, in five minutes, I'll definitely get anxiety attack. But it's literally not everything. There's a lot of uh, people who do not have uh, access uh, of internet. Um, and um, the, um, the um, uh, digital divide is still become uh, one of the um, main issues um, in the global south. So. Although this is not uh, specifically uh, the risk that arises from the public interest uh, platforms, but I feel that the public interest platforms should also uh, contribute into discussions on how to addressing um, this uh, access inequity. So yeah, I think I'll stop there and hopefully other people can also have more questions on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I just had one funny example to share on what I consider a public interest tech. And so my, my mom is from Tanzania, and a few years ago they started digitizing their government services. And so, you know, before, it, it's quite a centralized country, so before you'd have to go to the capital where the office is, you know, give the papers, the person's gone to lunch, the person's not around, the person has been sick for two months. And then they digitized the service. But what that basically meant was that um, most people couldn't fill the forms online. And so people would go to the office, but now there was a little kiosk outside where there was a man with a computer who would then <laughs> fill it in for you. So it was, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's a cost cutting measure and it's all these other things, but it's, it's also like, yeah, have we thought about whether people have the access and know how to fill online forms, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it, it's interesting in like how you bring people in the design of these things and, and thinking about those issues. But yeah, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I've hogged most of the questions. So I would love to open it to the floor if there are any questions for um, five of our amazing panelists. Or if you have stories to share. Hi, I'm Ziski from the Wikimedia Foundation. Thank you so much for a really wonderful and engaging discussion. I would love to hear other people's answers to one of the questions that you asked Nima, which is, 
I think it was about funding. I forget exactly what the phrasing was, so maybe you'll do me the honor of re-asking it. But I'd really like to know, um, from Bill's perspective, particularly because you're also an R&D, how you see funding working. Thank you so much. I'll just reframe the question for you, Bill. The question was, sure. how do you fund the infrastructure and maintenance required for a public interest internet? Please go ahead. It's a good question. Obviously, I speak from the BBC in the UK, so, so my obvious answer is you make everybody pay for it um, by, by forcing them by law to give you money to cover the public infrastructure that you require uh, through the television license that we have in the, in the UK. Uh, it's a sort of a frivolous answer, but it also actually has some serious um, intent behind it, which is that you don't get good public infrastructure for free. Um, the danger of having state funding media is, of course, that you then have state controlled media, and that's a very dangerous thing to have, and so you want to avoid it. But it feels to me that a society that wants an internet that can deliver public value should be able to invest in it and not require it to be self-sustaining on a commercial model. So I would much rather that we looked for a, a design and a set of functions that we wanted, that we believed could be, and we were using the term good fairly loosely earlier, so I'll carry on using it loosely, that was good for society, and then find a way for paying for it that does not require compromise. And from my mind, um, if what you're covering is the sort of core internet infrastructure, it's just moving the bits around, and you can get some guarantees from governments not to interfere too much, then a degree of state funding is acceptable because what you're paying for is the underlying network in the way that you're paying for the roads, or you're paying for water services and things like that. You're paying for the infrastructure of a society in order to allow civic society to flourish on top of it. So I'd much rather that sort of model than rely on, say, philanthropy or rely on private companies being able to do something commercial on there, but to stay good, because I think that sort of thing goes wrong. So, so I'm reasonably sort of firm in my own mind that um, paying for public infrastructure is a reasonable thing to ask a society to do. The problem is we don't yet know what we'd want to be paid for or indeed how much it would cost. Hope that's helpful. Thank you so much for that, Bill. Uh, we have, please go ahead, uh, either or. Hi, I'm Ivan Sigal from Global Voices. Um, I have a question about mobile technology. In much of the global majority, internet access is through um, telecoms. And as we're talking about the internet, we should also not neglect that question. I'm curious given that um, in many countries in the global majority, Facebook is de facto the internet, given its access point and often its free offerings, uh, how we reconcile the desire for a public interest internet in many global majority countries with the fact that most of the energy effort and resources is coming through telecoms, which is a different technology architecture. Thank you. Do you have someone you would like that question to go to? Um, in particular? Not really, though. Maybe UNESCO? That would be an interesting one. Okay. Let's yeah. go with that. Anna Christina. Um, well, it's a, different, a, a difficult question, but I, I actually was looking to a person that just stepped up because it's a very good sample of what you're mentioning. Um, of they, they started creating an Mexico and Central America and Latin America community networks with the community. They start building those networks. They actually work with UNESCO in a process of creating public policy, and that's the one that I was referring to, um, to promote um, indigenous expression and cultural content um, from all of the process of, like, creating community networks, but then engaging communities, indigenous communities in broadcasting, but also in generating uh, internet content um, and having the possibility to uh, create media and information literacy processes. But what I think is that, uh, and while I learn, it's that we need to learn also, and Bill just mentioned, from other expression of, of other experiences that have faced the same, the, 
kind of the same struggle, acknowledging that we have differentiated approaches when it comes to the internet, the scale, the, the way it, the way it functions, etc. I don't have a specific um, a specific answer of how um, how sustainability would come into place, but I think if we are talking about multi-stakeholder, is a word that comes all the time, all the way through. Uh, we also need to take in, into consideration that funding public interest technology comes to the responsibility of all of the actors that participate and, and, and engage in this process. So it's, it's just a responsibility from the governments and I, I totally agree with Bill, we, do, we cannot rely on governments because then it can keep, become co-opted. But there's part of responsibility of governments, there's part of responsibility of, pro of private sectors, there's part of responsibility of, of, of the users um, uh, and the people that engage in this. And so we need to define and create balances uh, where, where these come from. I, I, I urge you to talk to Redes because I really think that they have come up with a good idea of how to deal with this, acknowledging that the scale might not be, you know, like enormous, but the change would be very, very, uh, very, very good. Uh, yeah, so that would be my take. I'd yeah, I'll add on. I might actually connect it a step back because I think <clears throat> one of the things about the work, you know, you're doing at UNESCO to help with content moderation, and then this ties into, you know, sort of Wikipedia's woes around having to actually meet then those standards that are really designed for big tech. Um, so just connecting those dots, I think for Wikimedia, maybe other public interest platforms, that element of regulation really isn't helpful. In fact, I think it can be really counterproductive because ultimately, all of this, you know, even if it's multi-stakeholder, all of this effort is going into making big corporate platforms better. And maybe they're just not good. And maybe we shouldn't be using them because they're not awesome. And if we had more, more platforms, more choice, we would eventually just migrate off of them. But why it's important to consider con um, these larger platforms is they will end up being the only thing that's in place in a lot of places that don't have a robust uh, local economy or the ability to create these alternatives. So if we, we can't neglect really big multinational corporate tech platforms because they are big and a lot of people use them. A lot of places don't have the ability to, to completely modify the, um, the market or the landscape that they're working in. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that it's both, right? It's not either or. Like we have to do all the things. Um, but I do want to just lift up the fact that a lot of this regulation, I feel like there should be something called like the Wikipedia test or something, right? It's like, if your regulation is making it hard for Wikipedia, like your regulation is not great. <laughs> so, I mean, if anything, we should be asking a lot of questions of you all, like how do you do content moderation of disinformation at scale? We know you're doing it, T teach us how, right? And everyone else should be learning from it. Um, that's not currently what's happening and I have a lot of sympathy for that because the two are not equal, right? Um, and so that nuance gets lost. And, and ultimately, yeah, if a platform just is not working and there's a better one out there, thinking about social media and you know activity pub based platforms like Mastodon and other ones, let's let the bad one die. Let's use the better one that has better content moderation that fosters community better. But that's a sort of long term solution, and it's un it's going to be unevenly applied around the world. So. Thank you so much for uh, advocating for us. I think <laughs> I need to just copy paste what you're saying. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. On top of that, I think we what we are really trying to say to the policymaker is to have exceptions uh, for uh, non for private and public interest platforms like Wikipedia. But also um, internally, we understand one of the major hindrance um, is um, lack of understanding about decentralized community-based content moderations, especially in uh, the global majority country. Um, for example, in Asia, the issues of uh, internet regulation is considerably new and, and privacy protections. Um, so the default response is using fear-based approach um, to um, quote-unquote control it um, so that it doesn't create um, 
uh, you know, a public chaos or whatever based on the assumption. So I think one of uh, our main responsibility as public interest platform is to uh, educate uh, the lawmakers um, with our community uh, about the diversity of internet ecosystem and also alternatives content moderations um, tactics because there are different models. Um, so. Yeah, uh, and hopefully we can have uh, more allies to do that <laughs> um, and um, ensuring that communities are actively participating in that effort. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Does that answer your question? All right, we have a question back there. Thank you very much. I think very great panel. Uh, thanks you know, sharing all the information. So this is Najmul Hassan from uh, Bangladesh. I work with um, ActionAid, ActionAid Bangladesh, and particularly with the young people. Um, I'm very much interested you know, um, in terms of how young people are in being engaged in the internet and also cyber spaces. So you know, the internet, it's, um, it's not only globalized the world, but it was also centralized the whole process. This is a ch big challenging. I think this is the anti-democratic kind of uh, movement and process that we somehow, you know, we all are in, in this kind of process. So um, in our context, we see the, there is a huge digital divide, particularly we see uh, young men and young women, particularly in the grassroots, they don't have access to the infrastructure at the same time in the content. You know, we already mentioned about these languages and the um, the other aspects of the contents. And um, we see also stigma, you know, sometimes internet, you know, using internet is being stigmatized by the patriarchal interventions in the society. So when young girl and women are using internet, probably the uh, the society don't see this they look good kind of things. This is, you know, going in a different direction or challenging the social norms and we have this kind of things. Um, my interest is that since I work with the young people, how can actually we make and make more grassroots young people, young women, um, uh, under this kind of digital literacy network and bring up uh, particularly with this, you know, content generation and also make them as a kind of active, um, internet activist um, and for the social good. So this is could be uh, something actually would be really helpful for me. I think it goes directly to the Wikipedia at the once, but you can also respond to UNESCO. Uh, th thank you very much. Thank you so much for the questions. Um, I think um, engagement of young people has become one of our um, uh focus these days uh, because uh, as I shared earlier, majority of our editors are from the global north and um, coming from um, specific age group that are not young. Um, so what we are uh, currently trying to do is to work with community of editors um, to provide trainings, um, not only on how to use Wikimedia projects, but overall digital literacy that are uh, contextual and uh, culturally appropriate according to the needs of different young people, because as we all know, young people is also a diverse constituencies. So some of the example is um, our projects in Cambodia, where we uh, provide um, uh, capacity building and uh, tools for uh, young indigenous people to create um, content and also video uh, for preserving their culture. Um, and in addition to that, um, we are also working collaboratively with government, for example. In Indonesia, we, work, uh, we are collaborating with the Minister of IT to create um, a cyber creasy, which is a national digital literacy education uh, for a community of young people in school, but also in the community that have um, diff like various needs. Um, so it's definitely work in progress. Um, and we are hoping to have more collaborations with youth-led organizations to making sure that uh, we are still relevant in that case. I hope that answered your question and thank you for your questions. So uh, Vidya, Vidya would also like to give a response to this question. Vidya, please go ahead. Thank you, Nima. Thank you for the questions. Uh, so. Yeah, so for us, Traveloka, as a tech travel company, 
uh, you know, youth is part of the core of our, you know, of our ecosystem. When and then we divide it into two things when we talk about young people or youth. Number one, actually, uh, our talent pool, most of them are young people. We recruit like the best talent in Indonesia uh, for Indonesia market and for, for for other areas as well. But on top of that your point your question would uh, was how can young people work together uh and then you know create sa such an impact for community for their own community now in indonesia if you are familiar with the geography of indonesia we have more than uh 500 uh villages all over indonesia and working with the ministry of tourism and creative economy not only that we provide a digital literacy for for young people in those area but we empower them we encourage them to help their community to build a new tourism destination and using our platform we promote those tourism destination using their language using their analysis using their assessment on that uh, tourism area. So in a way we empower them to be proactive in looking what is the potential of their tourism destination and voices their uh, assessment toward their uh, the neighborhood. So that's how we empower uh, the young people uh, across Indonesia. But not only in Indonesia as well, we work with young people in Vietnam. We work with RMIT, a Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Vietnam to empower uh, young people to work with them in providing digital literacy for young people, for disability community, as well as for women-led uh, business. So I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Widya. All right, I'm going to start wrapping down the panel. And I, I feel like this has been a great, obviously this has been a very great conversation, but I feel like I'm leaving with more questions. Um, after this discussion, and some of these questions that I have are, how do you design public spaces or public goods? Um, I feel like we're a bit locked in with the designs that we have at present. What, how do we get out of that? How do we think about what platforms could look like? Who do you engage in those discussions? How, how, do, you, how do you build it and how do, you make, how do you make people come, right? So just building it doesn't mean people will come. Uh, Mallory, I know that you did say we would just move, but I remember when you know when the WhatsApp signal thing happened, and then we pretended to move, and then we didn't. A lot of us didn't really move. We just went back to WhatsApp. Um, I think we get stuck using platforms because you're like, I've already used it for 15 years. Like, I mean, I know it sucks, but I'm not. Oh, you know. Um, but I would love to see a new form of design. And my question is, yeah, how do we how do we how do we design that? Um, the other question I have is related to like, how do we have these conversations with lawmakers? Like, as civil society, I can see that we are annoying to governments, you know? If we first approach governments and said, we want data privacy, and then we come back and we're like, but not like that, you know, not for those people, but for these, like, yeah. I can also see from the government's point of view that it's, it's difficult to legislate for different people. So how do we have these conversations in a constructive way? Um, how do we encourage people to build public goods in a world where we, we're very money and monetization driven? How do we get back to that culture of volunteering and, and maintaining open source and that kind of stuff? How do we encourage, yeah, how do we, I mean, yeah, there was a conversation about encouraging young people, but just in general, like, how do we get more people to, to give their, their knowledge to Wikipedia? You know, why, why is it that group of people? It's amazing work that, you know, that they do give that information, but... What is it about that group that makes them give the information versus other groups? And then the big question, how do we fund the infrastructure? I really like Bill's point about how to think about it like a public service, like sanitation or, or water or any of those issues. Like we need media, we need spaces as a public service, physical and digital. And then my biggest question is, where do we take the conversation from here? So. Yes, it's nice to have this conversation, but what's next? How do we actually answer these questions? So we only have about five minutes left. And I would just love to hear from each speaker if you could really, really just keep it to one minute of a parting message to us of, of what's next. So I'll just go in the same order that we started. And uh, let's start with Mallory. One minute. All right, uh, challenge accepted. The I, so about leaving or moving, I um, just want to say that I don't think it's always about have we successfully moved off of or have we killed it. It's, th it's the threat. 
that we can. That's really important. <laughs> so while like, yeah, maybe we're all still using WhatsApp, but now we're maybe using both, or at least it started a conversation and it proves that users are paying attention. Who knew people were reading the terms and service of, of, of WhatsApp so closely that they could basically, ha they had a red line in their mind and they're like, they changed this sentence and I am furious about it. That was a really impressive moment to me because it demonstrated that people care. And that's just as important as people now don't use it anymore, they move to something else. So, and to that point, I think we have to stop thinking, I've said this already once, we're not replacing anything. We're not do. we're actually just moving into this incredibly complicated landscape where um, we're downloading apps all the time, we're trying out new things. I mean, at least a lot of us are, right? There's, there's more and more and more. Um, nothing's really dying anymore, right? So um, I would think that what's going to be important moving, moving forward is integration. And this is not exactly interoperability, but it does, I think, implicate things that Bill was saying about standards. Um, if your app or your new thing integrates with all the other ones, that's actually an asset and it's a feature and users are gonna come to expect it. And that's really, really good for competition and it's really good for end users. So I think that if you're building something new or if you're an ossified old social media platform that's been around for too long, if you don't start integrating or creating those features, you're not, people are not going to like you as much. Thank you so much. Um, I'll move. I'll stay with the people here. So Anna Christina, if you could go next, one minute, please. Yeah, I was thinking of uh, the government question because I, 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 I have heard within the consultation different views from one side. Well, governments are not all the same, and civil society is not all the same, and companies are not all the same. So everyone has their own opinion and their own comment, but. My thinking in all this process of consultation on the guidelines is the most important part is to build and to maintain, to be resist, to resist the, post, the process. Because what happens, as I said, is that we're very used to think as the regulation as the ultimate goal for the good and for the bad. And we don't see and it's difficult even for us to understand what is our role in the process of implementation, reviewing, monitoring, evaluation, et cetera. So I think, and I have to say this, in the question that we made specifically within the consultation, what a, where, what a multi-stakeholder role looks like in all of the stages of the regulatory process, this was the less responded question. Even though this word is a word that along with the Gen AI, is the most used in this <laughs> forum. So I think it is very important to identify, not like when we're dealing with the governments, what is also our role after regulation happens, you know, in, in, in dealing with the people that is engaged in the, in the regulatory process, and then afterwards in, in, those, um, in, in, in the evaluation of these regulations. Uh, because if not, then the, the regulatory cycle it has a bridge and it becomes, uh, you can, you know, like we were saying, and this is just to end, you can have the best law, you can have the best standard, but in an authoritarian regime, this can be misused. Mm. And the only way to, f to target it, to fight it, is with resilience, with capacity building, with, like, with a, a strong civil society that is advocating to, for change. So I think this is important. Thank you so much. Rachel, one minute. I think it's really important to back to basic um, and really um, promoting the um, internet uh, comments uh, for public interest um, and also reminding policy makers uh, about the diversity of internet ecosystem and providing exceptions to protect uh, public uh, interest platform. While at the same time, public interest platforms, uh, including Wikipedia, has to ensure um, the diversity of communities uh, yeah. that contributes in the creations of knowledge so that um, um, it will be positive for our sustainability and also the diversity of internet itself. 
Um, and I'll stop because time is up. <laughs> Thank you. Can we have two more minutes? Or it's like really time is up? Minutes? OK, two minutes. Um, Bill, please go ahead. One minute. <laughs> very, very briefly. I think we need to accept that the model of an internet based on the technical decisions made by a bunch of overly optimistic, um, mostly men uh, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, based in Northern um, America, North America and Europe has failed us and we need a different approach. Um, the answer is about co-creation and it's about bringing communities of interest together to decide what's important to them and to work on that basis, uh, to look at what we actually really need from the internet to build and sustain um, civic society. And so what I look forward to is actually revisiting some of those core assumptions and working together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. And lastly, uh, Vidya, please go ahead. One minute. All right, that will be quick. So again, uh, like what Bill said, the last part, collaboration, public-private partnership regulation need to, uh, to open a discussion for private sector to raise concern and for user, for society to raise concern. But on the other hand, company has the responsibility to ensure that uh, we will focus on customer needs, not only providing service, but what is important for society and digital literacy that is not only focuses on how people actually use technology, but also to ensure that people know their rights when they use technology. So twofold here, the regulation, the corporate sector working together with the ecosystem, and people need to, to know their rights. People need to be educated on how to use technology in a very responsible way. Thank you, Nima. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vidya. That's such a good note to end on. Thank you so much to all our amazing panelists. Thank you to everyone for joining us. This has been a really great conversation. And I wish you a wonderful rest of the IGF. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you.